next speaker, um, Dr. Nigel Seaton, from Cambridge, who's currently in sabbatical in Cornell. And I'll leave Nigel to introduce his paper. characterization of the pore structure we're interested in. And these are illustrated on this diagram. We've heard a lot about one of these, but not so much about the other uh, so far. Um, this is a little schematic of um, the pore solid in two dimensions. Um, we've heard quite a lot about the pore side distribution. We're interested in that certainly, and also in the topology. And in particular, the measure of the topology, a quantitative measure of the topology, which is the mean coordination number of the pore network, uh, which is essentially the number of pores that meet at the, at the junction within the solid. Uh, here, for example, the junction where Z, the coordination number equals 3, we're interested in the mean coordination number, which is that quantity added out of the whole pore network. But there's a conceptual difference between these two uh, types of property. This, of course, is, is a statistical measure of property of a single pore, or an aggregate of pores that is a single pore property, and this is fundamentally a property of the pore network in, in aggregate. These are the experimental data that we're going to analyze. These are data published by Jim Schwartz's group uh, in the Department of Chemical Engineering at, at uh, Syracuse. It's an absorption in a particular carbon absorbent uh, of three different species, which cause interaction with the solids in different ways, and in particular they're molecules of, of different size. Um, from the analytical point of view, it's convenient that they're roughly spherical molecules. So this is just the number of the volume absorbed STP versus the pressure. What I'm going to show you today in terms of analysis method is actually quite general, but all of the numbers and pictures that we see of can't refer to this particular um, these particular items versus this particular absorbent. This is how we obtain the pore size distributions. I should say perhaps that, that uh, our general approach is to obtain pore size distributions using each of these absorbates and then to compare them and see what we learn about the pore structure by this comparison. So in schematic terms, this is what we're doing. We have two uh, various isotherms here, but on the top of mine, where it's labeled real solid, this is the experimental isotherm. Uh, we have an isotherm for model solid. Model solid is <coughs> Uh, composed of some model solid composed of many pores. Each the behavior of each pore is obtained by uh, Monte Carlo simulation. I'll say something about that in a minute. Uh, these are the single pore isotherms, different to different sizes. We imagine we have a pore size distribution. The behavior of the model solid, the absorption isotherm of the model solid, is simply the integral over. Here we have two isotherms. We need many isotherms integrated over the pore size distribution gives the um, isotherm from the model solid as a whole. We obtain the pore size distribution by varying this function f of w until we get good agreement between the two isotherms, between the experimental isotherm and our model solid isotherm. This next slide is uh, famously copied from David Nicholson's talk, or at least looks like it is except that I've taken the course of using colour to make it look a bit different. Um, so this is, we're, we're simulating uh, carbon, this is, the, this is a sort of uh, first order model for a carbon pore, uh, many layers, infinite number of layers in principle of, of graphite, uh, absorbed molecules, the model spectrum is uh, defined by the structure and by the solid fluid and fluid fluid interactions, and uh, here's now the, the famous uh, uh, steel potential, correctly named this time, Tim. And uh, um, the uh, volume fluid fluid uh, interaction is, is the Lennon Jones potential, which is quite useful since all these molecules are roughly spherical. We're doing using, uh, and I'm, I'm grateful to almost every speaker before me this afternoon, having explained how this works, so I won't have to do it myself really. Uh, we're doing random canonical Monte Carlo simulation. We already know it's a stochastic simulation method. The molecules are moved around and added to be moved sample uh, a set of configurations that ought to be representative of the equilibrium. Uh, because we, we're using numerically these uh, 
simulated isotherms to, to correlate them in terms of functional form. In the end, it's just an equation that goes through the points. And here we're using the Hilbert work isotherm for that purpose. And uh, numerically or mathematically, just to show you that I've got this one equation, uh, it's a very familiar type of equation. Uh, the experiment of isotherm uh, on the left is the integral of the single four isotherm times the, the force distribution. And we just represent the simulation results as, a, as a, a density, as a function of pressure for a given force size. Uh, we're using the uh, dust, as many of you know, some numerical difficulties. Uh, it's arise in obtaining the best solution fitting to experimental data with experimental uncertainty and so on. We're using the Sayus method of Yagiro, who incidentally is in the audience just to answer difficult questions and I come up about the numerical method. Uh, so, um, here are some simulated isotherms. This is, well, looking in terms of three species. Uh, the isotherms form a somewhat similar to all type 1 isotherms. Um, this is uh, decreasing pore size as we go from top to bottom. But it turns out to be something quite uh, important about these isotherms, it's not at all obvious when you look at them, look at them at first. Uh, I won't mention it now, but we'll come back to it in a, well, in a few minutes when we need to. The, uh, uh, this is the isotherm to CF4. David uh, has already explained, I think, why these isotherms are sometimes fast to do with the, the packing of high density, the packing of uh, favorable or unfavorable geometries for packing uh, integer numbers of layers in pores at, at, at high pressure. Uh, this we would see, of course, with all species, we would see the methane and the pressure being high enough, which in our simulations it isn't. Uh, and it's simply that we're introducing the, the pressure range that corresponds to the experimental measurements. Uh, of course, we noticed that being a heavier or strongly absorbed molecule, the CF4 isotherms generally have high Hermes constants, and uh, to the highest pressure they've attained a high level of absorption, as the case with methane. Here, the, the isotherms for SF6, um, again, we have this crossover uh, effect of high pressure. The Hermes constant is now very, very high. Absorption is it's a large molecule, very strongly absorbed. So we've done this uh, fit, and uh, this is the fit. So these are the data we had before with uh, that's the points and the, the curves are the, uh, the, the data. The fit is extremely good. Many of you will know that it's not difficult to get an extremely good fit when doing force size distributions, but uh, uh, at least we have to get it. If we don't get a good fit, then it means there's a problem. <coughs> So, so now I'm going to show you the results, the pore size distribution. And uh, when we first got this, we weren't uh, very impressed with it. And let me explain why it's not obvious. Uh, we, we were hoping to do two things here. One, one is to uh, get some information about, to get uh, information about the physical structure of the pore size distribution and information about connectivity, the topology of the pore network. But we also uh, would hope to be able to, get, uh, to use this as a check of consistency. So there ought to be some consistency between these, these PSD functions as they're representing the same underlying reality. Now the first and uh, perhaps alarming thing about looking at this, 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 these uh, results is if you look at the left hand side, so the blue is the is methane, we have a, a, low, a peak at, at uh, very small pore sizes. And in fact this first peak is below uh, the point at which the, the, the smallest uh, pore that CF4 can enter. So where this symbol stop is where we reach the pore that these that, that particular species can't enter. So that peak's okay, that's um, how we've done that physically. What about this peak? This is very much a variance with the data for CF4 and SF6, and it overlaps quite a lot with the CF4 peak. So what's going on there? Well, it turns out that this, uh, although it would be rather alarming at first sight, it turns out that it isn't. If we look, if we look uh, back at this um, set of isotherms for, for CH4, and what the, the, the uh, algorithm is doing is it's trying to, just, to pick out the, the presence of in certain amounts of pores of different sizes. If we imagine that the, the, the uh, point here is that the isotherm becomes increasingly linear as we increase the pore size, so that down here we're very much in the Henry's law region, and even these isotherms 
have learned to be a little curvature, and so they start to look at their rather linear, and they become very similar. Um, so if we imagine what the, the, the algorithm is doing, uh, the algorithm can't be, tell the difference between one pore of that size, whatever it is, with the, the solid triangles, and two pores represented by the diamonds, very roughly, they will, they will have exactly the same effects on the overall model solid isotherm. So the algorithm can't, it can't detect, or is increasingly bad at detecting differences between pore sizes, discriminating between pore sizes, above perhaps somewhere in the screen, about perhaps uh, 0.9 nanometers. So we have no power to discriminate above, above roughly 0.9 nanometers. And if we look here, then we see that uh, 0.9 nanometers is about here. And what it means is that this peak gives an amount of absorption, which is roughly right. But the peak itself could be here, could be here, could be here, or could be anywhere. In effect, all we're doing really with this peak is measuring something like a, a, a total surface area for that peak. And the location of it could, could be anywhere, it could be several peaks. So we, we uh, can't know anything from this peak as it's, it's, uh, it's unreliable. If we look at the other end, compare SF6 and CF4, well, these peaks are in the same location. The volumes of the pores there turn out to be uh, fairly similar. Uh, one peak is wider than the other. But it turns out, and I can talk about this later if necessary, that uh, for the larger pore sizes, the sensitivity decreases. And uh, having small differences here uh, perhaps isn't that important. So there's a reasonable degree of agreement there. So we, we don't worry about this. There's reasonable agreement there. So this, we can understand that there's at least reasonable consistency. Well, what do we learn from this peak? Well, if there's something more interesting going on. Well, let's take a look at that in more detail because it turns out that that peak <coughs> gives us a, a, a grip of the, the connectivity. Before I do that, though, uh, let's think just before I look at that thing, let's think about what we're, what we're learning about the pore size distribution. Well, what is the true pore size distribution? Well, I think that fundamentally the answer to that is that there isn't a true pore size distribution. It depends uh, what sort of question you're trying to answer, whether you're interested in ultimately absorbed molecules of certain sizes or, or whatever kind of process you're interested in. But we can talk about perhaps the closest thing to a true pore size distribution here is the pore size distribution of pores accessible to methane that being the smallest that's all we've used. And what is that? Well, it's, it's this smallest peak, uh, and with the next smallest molecule that's, that's been absorbed is, is, is uh, CF4. Um, so let's add in those two peaks. I've labeled this peak as the exact PSV. This doesn't mean exactly right, because we don't know whether this is actually right. What it means is that it's exact in terms, in the context of our model. The, here, these contributions are a lower bound on the PSD of pores accessible to methane, simply because uh, all the methane molecules will certainly, will certainly enter these pores, but there might be some other molecules that will be accessible to methane that uh, can't actually be uh, thrown by CF4, simply because there might be a pore that's big enough for methane and CF4 to enter, um, but the, 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 the uh, um, CF4 molecule can't get past a constriction and enter, and enter uh, all the velocity that's large enough to accommodate CF4. So these uh, two peaks are lower bound on the PSD accessible to methane. But we can at least see that by combining these different absorbates, we can get, uh, um, we can get a, a relatively complete picture of the PSD over a range of pore sizes. Looking now to the connectivity, let's look at these, these peaks. Well, they should be representing the same behavior, really. Uh, Notice where these curves finish. These are the smallest pore sizes accessible to those molecules. Uh, from here, that's the graph we're on from here. From here to the left, then we'd expect to get. Uh, we we learn nothing by the comparison because the CF4 can't get into the CSF6 can't get into those pores to the left of that of that pen. <coughs> To the right, if we had a model which had infinite connectivity, so that all the pores had complete access to the vapor phase, then these should be coincident. Uh, in fact, we've got something rather odd here, that the SF6 curve is actually larger. That's, uh, I think, just clearly just a, 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 a due to the approximate nature of our, we've got the assumed pore state and, uh, and approximate model and so on, approximately correct uh, physical model and so on. Um, the general message that we get here is that uh, the SF6 curve is below CF4, or at least the volume of the SF6 uh, 
and, or the volume of pores in the SF6P is less than the volume of pores in the, in the CF4P, which means that, and we can imagine, I, mean, I think what really is happening is that this SF6P, the model's putting it a bit too far to the right, and really it should be shifted over to the left a bit. But at any rate, the volume of the velocity in these peaks is less for SF6 than it is for CF4. It's a kind of molecular sitting effect. So how can we understand that? Well, it's always easy to understand these are the simple pictures, for me at least, of the complicated pictures. If we look at this, uh, let's imagine we've got a very simple pore network with four pores. Uh, this, these two molecules are scrapped in CF4. This molecule, these molecules can fold the whole pore space in a simple network, and the pore size distribution has uh, takes two big pores here and two small pores here. If we have a bigger molecule, which for us is SF6, then uh, we detect only this large pore. We of course don't take the small pores, which we would never expect to be able to do because the molecules won't go in. But this is the point: we also lose this pore. So not only do, is the pore size distribution cut off and has a, has a gap here, which we understand very well, uh, we also lose this pore here. So that, that this uh, difference between this and this, in our very simple case, is exactly the difference between the SF6 and CF4 here, accepting the fact that one of the pieces moved along a bit and uh, this wasn't quite the right place. How do we analyze that? Well, if we have uh, a pore network, uh, of a highly, inter highly interconnected network, the natural language for doing this is percolation theory, and I don't have time to talk about this in any detail at all, but I'll be happy to answer questions. Uh, we defined a variable called the scale of accessibility. Uh, I call it scale because percolation theory people use something else for the accessibility. It's the, simply the ratio of the number of the pores that the SF6 can enter in reality to the number of pores that are large enough to accommodate it. So if we had infinite connectivity, then this number would be 1. But because some of the pores are obscured, then this number is less than 1. And this number is, is 1 half for the little pore network I showed you earlier. Uh, so the accessibility is just the ratio of the, this is the um, pore size distribution of the probe molecule in our language, which is for us as SF6. This represents the true pore size distribution, or what we think is as close as we can get to the true pore size distribution. The W simply comes from going from a poor volume distribution to a poor number distribution, and geometrically what we're doing is integrating from the minimum pore size over these two pore size distributions and taking the ratio. <coughs> what percolation tells us about connectivity is this, in schematic terms. This is the accessibility versus the size of the probe molecule. But let's look at this in two ways. Let's look at one of these, so Z here is a parameter, let's look at one of the, 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 the curves so we get the value of Z. If we have a small molecule, it can get worm everywhere in the pore network. And as long as it can get, has free access to all the pores, then A is 1. It doesn't mean to say it can get into all the pores, because it will still be able to get into the pores that are too small for it to get into. But if A is 1, it means it's not, that there are no pores that you should be able to get into, that are shielded from it by very small pores. As we increase the size of the probe molecule, it can get to, it, it's excluded from some regions of the pore space, and A becomes smaller, and then eventually it goes essentially to zero, and that's the percolation transition, when it can no longer get access to the network itself as a, as a whole. If we now look at the effect of Z, if we increase Z, it means we've got a more highly connected pore network, there are more ways to get to getting to, from A to B inside the, in the pore network, and the accessibility increases for any given value of uh, the, the size of the probe molecule. This is a schematic. We have simulation results for um, percolation behavior in poor networks. We can do this numerically. What we do is we know the size of the probe molecule gives us the horizontal coordinate. The vertical coordinate is calculated from the pore size distribution. And, uh, we fit, and we fit that to simulation data, which we know is a function of Z. So in fact, we know all these curves in simulation terms. Uh, I don't use true data, real data here because actually the pore size distribution comes into the scaling of this axis. So that's why I don't actually show you the, the real simulation data. But schematically, that's what happens. And the result that we get in this case is a number, Z is 2.3, which is a quite um, sparsely connected network. That's the result of a particular sample that we analyzed. That's more or less the end of my talk. The only thing I want to show you to end 
is the, what happens when we use different temperatures. We have results that they measured at, uh, in Jim Schwartz's groups, uh, uh, results of three different temperatures, and we obtain pore size distributions of three different temperatures. And these are the results, and there's really quite good agreement. Uh, there's, uh, there's some differences, certainly the peaks in the same place, the volumes are about the same. So this, I think, supports very much this use of molecular simulation to get pore size distributions. The other thing I should tell you is that uh, this number here, Z of, is 2.3, is the same to two significant figures as shown here at these different temperatures, which, although the characterization will never prove anything absolutely, this suggests that both the connectivity and the pore size distribution analyses are physically uh, justifiable. And with that, I'd like to stop. Thank you very much. We really must cut it short now, but we'll have a chance to quiz Nigel later. Thank you very much.